Well, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, we're going to continue this study of reading from A.T. Jones. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the opportunity that we have once again to study together. We ask for your Holy Spirit uh, to be here to teach us. And we are thankful, Lord, for uh, the trials of this past week and the strength that you have given us to endure. And we ask, Lord, for your strength in the week ahead. We pray that as we um, take this time on the Sabbath, that we can receive the blessing that is promised. And we know, Lord, that there are many things you want to teach us. And we ask that we can be willing and able to learn these things, that you can strengthen us. Help us to understand the connection of righteousness by faith to the gospel and to the, to the three angels' messages, to understand these things that Jones is bringing out, and to understand the connection to our time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> So um, one of the things that we looked at last night, and I'm just going to go back a little bit here, is that Jones had brought up this statement from the uh, spirit of prophecy regarding um, uh, the first, second, and third angel's message. So let's see if I can find that again. It's a little ways back. Go so slow when you have a big file. No, which how far back it was. Anyway, he was showing this parallel. Um, yeah, here it is. While you hold the banner of truth firmly, proclaiming the law of God, let every soul remember that the faith of Jesus is connected with the commandments of God. The third angel is represented as flying through the midst of heaven, symbolizing the work of those who proclaim the first, second, and third angel's messages. All are linked together. So Jones is seeing this, though I don't think he fully understands the significance as we would at this time. But he is giving this message, even though he's talking about the third angel's message. That's the, uh, the topic of his series that he's doing at the 1893 General Conference. Um, he understands the significance, at least in Ellen White's writings, that these are all linked together. <coughs> and that this is the everlasting gospel, this three-step testing prophetic message. So he's now going to be dealing with preaching this gospel. And, and we can see the absolute parallel between uh, his time and what's happening in our time in connection with this movement. Uh, we saw that, that um, you know, Colin did a series on uh, last Sabbath um, de dealing with uh, the just shall live by faith and addressing the prediction that he had regarding Trump. And the implication there is that we just need to believe, but we know that Faith is not something that is based upon um, a supposition. It's based upon the sure word of God and the experience that we have in walking with God daily. That is to understand where we are by faith is much different than to just decide that you're going to believe something uh, to be true. And this is the problem that Jones, in a sense, has because he wants to believe that we can have the power of God, and he's teaching the correct message, that this, that this comes from this connection with God, recognizing that we have no power of our own, and that the world is more powerful than us, and that if we're going to stand in that time, uh, we're going to need the power of God, and that the power of God is the gospel. So... The need of the Holy Spirit, um, which he had started this series out with, 
he's talking here also, which we talked about last night, which we read, this idea that things have to come in such a way or else it would not be the Holy Spirit. And we can't uh, prescribe uh, how this is going to happen, how this, how this message is going to unfold. However it will unfold is it's not going to unfold according to our ideas and our wishes our plans, our calculations. It's going to unfold in a way that we will see that it is God that has taken the, the work into his own hands. And this is, really, this is really what righteousness by faith is about. And, you know, we could look at the situation presently, especially in this movement, and we could say, well, you know, things have to happen in this certain way or that certain way. We know where we're headed. We're headed to a situation where we're going to uh, confess our sins, that we're going to repent, and that we will be reconciled to one another. But how that's going to come about, I don't know. I remember uh, this brother Emmanuel is his name. He changed his last name. I can't remember what his last name was originally. Um, but uh, he was at one of our studies back um, in, uh, after July 18, 2020. And, and he was talking about how, you know, we need to have some kind of committee get together, get Jeff and all the elders together. And we have to decide what July 18 was about. And, and he was extremely persistent in that. He wasn't really listening to what I was saying. Plus, he kept cutting me off all the time. Um, so um, so we went on. We After the meeting, we ended up uh, talking for quite a while. And. And he's pretty much never talked to me since. I mean, I've had a couple of email communications where he condemned me, um, but that's not really the point. Uh, the point is he had this idea that somehow it has to happen in such a way. If we're going to figure out, uh, you know, July 18th, it has to be done in a certain way. And my view was that there's nothing we can do about any other person. I can't force somebody to meet together um, and to look at things openly and honestly. That's the work of the Holy Spirit upon the individual heart. Amen. And, you know, he, he obviously didn't really understand what I was talking about um, and why I wasn't receptive to his idea. I tried to explain it, but maybe I didn't explain it well enough. But we can't prescribe to God how things are going to happen. And, and it's not going to happen in the way that we imagine. Because one is we have a hard time really imagining the part that we have to play, what God has to do in our lives to help us see our sins. You know, we know that when we imagine these scenarios, at least maybe I'm unique in this point, but, you know, you always imagine the other person apologizing to you. You know, when you have a conflict with somebody, you know, if they just did this thing, if they just recognize some point, if they recognize how much they hurt me or whatever thing it is, that's how we imagine things. But these are not how God, this is not how God works. And it's not, it's not, these, these wounds are not healed up in a few words. But it's not really words that cause the healing. It's, it's a realization of, of how much we have hurt another person, how much we have hurt the truth, how much damage we have done, how we have crucified Christ afresh. These are the things that we have to be brought to understand if we're going to be reconciled to our brother. It's not some easy thing. It's, it's a big trial that awaits us if we're going to end in together in the upper room. <clears throat> so now he's, Jones is going to go on about what it is we preach about the gospel. So in other things, he says another thing they were to preach. What? The gospel. And Paul defines the gospel over and over to be the mystery of God, which been hid from ages and generations, now made manifest to his, his saints, they preach that gospel, the mystery of God. And what is it? What is that? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ, the power of God, 
and the wisdom of God, the unsearchable riches of God, Christ and him crucified. That is what it was, nothing but that. Now, you know, of course, in uh, Romans chapter 1, um, uh, you know, Paul defines <clears throat> uh, the power of God, right? And this is uh, dealing with the mystery of godliness. And that starts in... Uh, <clears throat> And, and dealing with the gospel, Romans 1, 16. I'm just going to go there. I, I don't know if Jones goes there or not. <clears throat> but one thing that Paul says, he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. <clears throat> so if we if we go back to to Collins' presentation last Sabbath, which I didn't watch, I've, I've read the notes. Um, so some of these things I've implied by what he, what he's saying, so I could be wrong. But if we take that the just shall live by faith, we can see that this is based upon the power of God, which is the gospel, and we know that the gospel is, of course, the everlasting gospel which is a three-step testing prophetic message. And that it is an experience that we have to go through. That is, we can't get to step three without step one and two. And <clears throat> that often we're trying to get to step three without one and two. What I mean by that simply is if we don't understand our experience, what God has brought us through, and we, we believe that we're at step three. When we're not at step three, we're not, we're not going to be prepared when step three comes, if that makes sense. I don't know if I've said that correctly or not. but um, you, said it, you have said it directly, and you have said it and presented it well. Because in order to be ready for step three, we need to know what step two is. We need to experience it. Now, when we look at the lines, you know, we, we've marked these out so many times. We're in this movement. We know what the lines are. We know, we look at Millerite history. We see the first angel's message. It arrives. It's formalized. It's empowered. And then when the second angel arrives, the Protestants fail that test. But then we know the second angel now has arrived. And it's this seventh month movement. And you see all of these people, um, basically, uh, it, this message is empowered at the midnight cry on August 15th. You see these people um, who've been mourning from their first disappointment, now alive with this message. You know, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. But when they get to the arrival of the third angel's message and their expectations are not met, they're not able to receive the third angel's message, the vast majority of them. Only a few can actually receive that message. That means only a few really understood their experience. Now, we know that many people who were involved in that seventh month movement in the midnight cry could still look back at that experience and say that it was one of the, the most blessed experience of, the, of their lives, even if they had already rejected October 22nd, 1844. So there was a power in that experience, but we also have to recognize it. We have to understand what it is that God is doing and to accept that third angel's message, the message of righteousness by faith is not an easy task. It's not something that can just be entered into by a simple uh, acknowledgement of the truth of the gospel. It has to be experienced. And that's why I believe that Ellen White says the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity, or righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, right? So righteousness by faith, in the third angel's message, we see the reality. 
We see Christ's character upon his people. And that's at the empowerment of the third angel's message. It's seen at the Sunday law. Of course, it has to be experienced before that, because the everlasting gospel is this message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. The development part is the first and second angel's message. The demonstration is the third angel's message. <clears throat> now, we also know in Romans chapter 1 that, that he's going to contrast the righteousness of God with the unrighteousness of men. And what Paul's going to describe in Romans chapter 1 is basically the situation we see in the world today. But it's also many of these characteristics are characteristics we see in the movement presently. So we often will single out the things like homosexuality, and murder, and so forth. But people that are backbiters, are they not included in this? Covenant breakers? People yep. that are full of envy, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers? I mean, this, this describes this movement. What's that? And don't want to be admonished or corrected. Yeah. So, so we've seen this. I mean, we've seen the type of attitude and we've experienced it ourselves in ourselves. So we know that the power of the gospel that he talks about here has not been experienced fully in us. And if it's not experienced fully in us, there's no, that we, no way we can stand at the Sunday law. So the proclamation of the truth is not something that can just be done unless we have actually experienced it. You can't call people out of Babylon if you're still in Babylon. <clears throat> so let's go back to Jones here. So we have all these things that he describes of what the gospel is, the mystery of God, etc. And he says, and Paul defined in the sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians, you remember, as having nothing yet uh, defined it in the sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians. You remember, as having nothing and yet possessing all things, at verse 10. Don't you see the poor, poverty-stricken condition of the man that holds to what he has in his hands in this world? Don't you see the poor, poverty-stricken condition of that Seventh-day Adventist that will now hold to what he has in this world? He must have more than that, or he will never get through the time of trouble. But when we let everything go and count ourselves as having nothing, then what? Then what will we have? All things. Then we cannot take um, anything away from us. The people who are in that condition, Nothing can be taken from them. Now, is that so? And the congregation says, yes, of course it is. They cannot take power from us, can they? They cannot take the character from us. They cannot take our riches from us. They cannot take our life from us, for Christ is our life. And they cannot take him from us. So when we are in this position, we have the victory over the world and all its power to start with. Of course, this is really quite a basic idea. But it's much easier to speak about than to put into practice. And the reason we have the gospel, why we have these prophecies, why we have these timelines, why we have these reform lines, is because for us to get to that point, it happens step by step. It doesn't happen all at once. You know, when I came to God, you know, when I was 17 on August 11th, uh, 1980, I was just beginning a journey. I gave my heart to, to the Lord. I had peace. I was reconciled to Christ. But I would not be ready for the things that would happen at the Sunday law, let alone was I even really ready for the things that were going to follow right after. I had to go through experiences 
And all of us have experienced that. We know that when we came to Christ, we were far from where God wanted us to be in character. We were accepted in the, the beloved, but we also understood that we couldn't just remain in that condition, that we had to progress, that we needed to be uh, fashioned after his likeness. So uh, Jones goes on. He says another phrase in that connection, having nothing yet and possessing all things, as poor yet making many rich, that is our work in the world, to make people rich. As Jesus became poor, that we might be made rich. So we become poor, that many others may become rich. And so when we have Christ, Christ only, nothing but the unsearchable riches of Christ, we can take everybody rich who will take the free gift of, we can make everybody rich who, take, who will take the free gift of the riches they preached the mystery of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory, but there arose another mystery. It began to appear while they were preaching. This mystery that they were to preach had been hid from ages and generations. Now it was manifested as never before in the world. But while they were preaching that mystery, there appeared the working of another mystery. And that mystery of iniquity arose and hid again the mystery of God. After the apostles died, that mystery of iniquity arose and spread over the world and hid again the mystery of God from ages and from generations, didn't it? But when we come to the 10th chapter of Revelation, an angel is there represented as standing with one foot on the sea and the other on the land and crying with a strong voice and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are there that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he, begin, be, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. I've wondered lately whether that is not intentional, that it is put in that way, that the mystery of God should be finished instead of shall be finished. It should have been finished long ago. The testimonies have told us that, but by our dilatoriness, our slackness, our slowness to believe God, it is not finished. And he said it should be finished, right? So this, of course, we know is referring to Millerite history. Now, thank the Lord that it is finished indeed, that it is to be finished indeed. If he would speak now, he, could, he would say it shall be, of course. But, but the point is that when the voice of the seventh angel should begin to sound, the mystery of God stands forth to the world. What is that? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the everlasting gospel. That is the third angel's message. Then don't you see how it is that God has settled it in that the third angel's settled it that the third angel's message, the mystery of God, shall triumph over the mystery of iniquity. And that as certainly as the mystery of iniquity has held the attention of the world. And has attracted the gaze of the nations and the wonder of men. Just so certainly the mystery of God will attract the attention of nations and the wonder of men. It will do it. Now let us turn to the book of Joel. So before we do that. So just looking at what he's talking about here. Like he's referring of course to Revelation chapter 10. Now this is the the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. What is that referring to in Revelation chapter 10? Because um, he addresses this, but he doesn't. <clears throat> so that's in uh, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared unto his servants, the prophets. So what is this voice of the seventh angel? What, what angel is being referred to here? The uh, seventh trumpet. Right, the seventh trumpet. And when does the seventh trumpet sound? Does it not begin to, to sound about 1844? October 22nd, 1844, to be precise. And yet, here we have, with Revelation 10, 7, 
Right. Another symbol. Yeah, the 10th day of the seventh month. Exactly. Now, we know that the sixth angel had ceased to sound when? We knew that the sixth angel had net, not yet ceased sounding in 1842. Wasn't that Foy's comment? Okay, so so here was the problem that they had. So they believed that that the the seventh trumpet ended with the end of the second woe, or the sixth trumpet ended with the end of the second woe, right? That's how the Millerites understood it when we examined okay. it, right? So they believed that August 11th, 1840 was then the end of the sixth trumpet, and they would take it, well, the seventh angel is going to sound soon, right? Okay. They didn't know how long it was going to be, but the sounding of the voice of the seventh angel would be um, these events that were going to occur that they still were looking for. By the time they got to 1844, of course, they weren't looking for those events to occur anymore. Well, but with this, with Revelation 7 or 10, 7. Yeah. With the symbol of the 10th day of the seventh month. Could this also not be a symbol of 70 years? I don't know why you would put 70 years here. What, what's... In 1773, you had a pope that removed the Jesuits. And for 25 years, until 1798, <clears throat> there was, wasn't there a period of relative peace yeah. coming from the papacy? Yeah. So this, this period then looking at 70 years until the seventh trumpet was sounding. Yeah, so you'd get 1843. Correct. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know if I would do that, but I'm not sure why we would do that. I mean, I understand. Okay. What, what I'm saying here is that there is the days in the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound. The mystery right. of God should be finished. And my point is that this also refers to this period of time when the sixth angel, according to the Millerites, should have ceased sounding, August 11th, 1840. Um, but the voice of the seventh angel doesn't really sound to October 22nd, 1844. But there is this period of time in which this angel is waiting to sound, right? It's beginning to sound, if that makes sense. Right. My point here is it does sound on October 22nd, 1844. But I, I, I take it as referring to also, in a sense, including that period of the 1,533 days. That Agreed. is, it's waiting to sound, right? Shall begin to sound in that days of the voice of the seventh angel. Now, so we do start at October 22nd, 1844, but we know there is that seeming delay of the Millerites. And that's what I'm saying that when it said the mystery of God should be finished. There was a work that was so, supposed to be done from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844, that really wasn't accomplished. Christ could not have returned on October 22nd, 1844, because the world was not ready. God's people were not ready. The third angel had not yet arrived. They were still under the second angel. Right, not to be confused here with the angel numbers of the trumpets. But if you understand what I mean, they were under the first and second angel's messages. So this work now that we are under is under the third angel's message. This movement is presently under the proclamation of the third. A.T. Jones understands this. Right. But he also recognizes that, that the mystery of God should have been finished ere this, even in his day. But we, we know that when we take Revelation 10, 7, 
he, he's not going into a study of this, but we see this little book that's open in the hand of the angel, right? And that we have to eat this little book, which in our is going to be bitter in our belly, but in our mouth sweet as honey. And so this movement is uh, built upon this understanding. And this is true of this movement today. If we're going to be paralleling uh, Millerite history with our history, we know that we have this bitter experience, but we also have this sweet message. Many people want the sweet message, but they don't want the bitter experience. But you can't really have the sweet message without the bitter experience. Would we agree with that? Most definitely. The thing that makes the message sweet to a large degree is, is, the, is that it's, you know, notice they have the belly, the belly bitter first in the state, statement. We need that bitter experience in order to have a message. And yet we want to deny the bitter experience. Now, somebody said something. No, I just said gold tried in the fire. Tried the fire. Yeah. So now Jones is going to turn to the book of Joel, or Joel, or however you say it, and read that second chapter again, right? So we know what the second chapter is about. There are some things that we want to study. The first part of it, you remember, up to the 12th verse, not including the 12th, is a picture of the coming of the Lord. And if you turn to that testimony, volume one, page 180, that tells about the shaking, you will find this chapter there given by the spirit of the Lord as the reference on which is based that idea. It applies to the time of the shaking. The shaking prepares for the loud cry. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, the great people and the strong, there hath not ever been the like, neither shall there any more be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? So Joan says the parallel is Revelation 19, 11 to 18. Therefore also now, said the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting and weeping and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Who here knows that when a person seeks the Lord with all the heart, whether or not the Lord will return and leave a blessing behind him. If we know he will, then let us go at it. There is all the encouragement in the world. 
just as certainly as we know he will do that. There's nothing to hinder us from seeking him with all the heart because as we know he will get the blessing. Let us have it. Now let's just go back a little bit here. So he's going to refer to Re Revelation 19, uh, 1 to 11. He's not going to read it. Or 1 to 8, 11 to 18, pardon me. And that's going to be the rider on the white horse. Right? So that's going to be, I saw heaven open and behold the white horse and him that sat on him was called faithful and true. So he's going to parallel these two things. This is Christ conquering. So when we look at Joel uh, chapter 2, so let's go there. Um, so this is the day of the Lord. So this, this army is what, whose army? Whose army is this on the day of the Lord in Joel chapter 2? Isn't this God's army? Yeah, so this is God's army, right? Now, why, why do we have God's army here in Joel chapter 2? Isn't this showing God's people standing arrayed for the battle? against the forces of darkness okay so when we look at joel chapter one right we're going to see this this and this uh invasion of locusts these are the four generations right and how did jeff understand this that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. How did Four Jeff generations. Four What's generations. That? Okay. Four generations. Yeah. But his application, so it's four generations. But what was his original application? What was the controversy in the book of Joel over these verses? Oh, they thought it had something to do with Islam. Okay, so they believe that it had to do with Islam. And Jeff yeah. said, no, it had to do with what? Rome. To With Rome. Right. Because Rome establishes the vision. Right. Yeah. And he's going to take it basically. Um, if we want to look at it. This would be if we're going to line it up with the churches, you know, um, uh, not the churches, but the, the, the seals. Right. You're going to have those four seals. You're going to have this destruction, this persecution that comes from the Romans powers first of course, from pagan Rome and then from papal Rome, right? And, and we can line it up with the churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira. Those are four generations as well. So, so we can line this up in that, in that way, that it's, it's judgments that come upon um, the world because of Rome. Rome is given this persecutory power, Correct. Yes, thanks. So. Amen. Um, and in a sense, this is the apostasy that we see, right? God's truth, truths are being destroyed. And we see this in Adventism. So we can take these and apply them to the four generations of Adventism. 1844 to 1888, 1888 to 1919, 1919 to 1957 and 1957 to the end, right? In the fourth generation, 1989 occurs. But we're set in a sense, still in the fourth generation to a degree, right? That is the, the reform line that we're in began in the fourth generation. And, and part of how we looked at that is where do we first get the four generations? Where are they first mentioned? Well, you have the first four kings. Okay, well, that's not the first time, though. The first four generations, Genesis chapter what? Uh, 
Well, you got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Okay. So, I mean, we could take that. I mean, I, I never thought of that, of course, um, because we have those four generations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But we also say that they're going to come out of Egypt in the fourth generation, right? So Genesis 15. So we know there are four generations of the sojourning of the children of Israel that lead to them entering into Egypt. Right, Joseph being the fourth generation. And that there are four generations from Levi uh, to Aaron, right? And they come out in the fourth generation. The 430 years don't end with the birth of Aaron or Moses. The 430 years are going to end 83 years after uh, the birth of Aaron, right? So we yes. have a form line that begins in the fourth generation, and they come out in the fourth generation. And so that would be true in our time. So we have these four generations. Um, so tell it, tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. So that's four generations, right? Because there's you, your children, their children, and their children. Yes. Okay. So these four generations we can apply to Adventism. So that means we, if we can do that, we can take uh, this as referring to the end of the world. So even though it has an application to Rome, we have a repeat of history. Right. And, and Dwight spent some time dealing with uh, Joel. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. And, and this is the work that has to be done now for God's people. Because we know that the armies of the Lord are coming to destroy this earth. And if we have anything to do with this earth, then we will be destroyed with it. They're going to repeat that, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify it fast, call a solemn assembly in chapter 2. So you can see this. It's in chapter 1, this call to repentance. Right? And it's in chapter 2. Why is it repeated here? God is giving his warning again so that we may agree and see that we need to come into reunion with him and not stand in the flame of our own kindling. And this is a repeat of history. Yes. Right. And then chapter three is God judging the nations. And we know we can apply this to past history. But those past histories reflect our time. So there's lots in the book of Joel, um, just as there was in Revelation chapter 10, that um, A.T. Jones isn't really addressing. <clears throat> Who here knows that when a person seeks the Lord, oh, I better sh change my screen, sorry. With all the heart, whether or not the Lord will return and leave a blessing behind him. So we know that God will. So then he's going to quote from Joel, blow the trumpet, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts, that the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bridegroom out of her closet. How many people in Zion does that include? 
the people, the congregation, the children, the elders, the babies, the bridegrooms, the brides? How many does that call? The audience says all. Yes, all. What does it call us to? To seek the Lord with all the heart, then let us do it. We are in the time. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Have not the heathen got things in their own hands so that they propose to rule over us? And they propose to blot out the Sabbath of the Lord and rule over the world. Right? So we know that's the situation that we see. We've seen this manifest in our day. And Jones is talking about this to people, right? Remember he talked um, in the reading yesterday uh, about these people that he has been presenting to, heathen, and showing them what's happening. You know, infidels, people who are not, not Christians. And they're wanting to know what they can do. And he says the only thing they can do is seek God's power because this world has more power than we have. The power of the world is, is going to rule over us. The only way we can be free from that is if we have God rule over us. I think I have a word here that I had better read on, perhaps on page 17 of the testimony entitled To the Brethren in Responsible Positions. I've read these words. The false Sabbath is to be enforced by an oppressive law. Satan and his angels are wide awake and intensely active, working with energy and, and perseverance through human instrumentalities to bring about his purpose of obliterating the knowledge of God. What is the Sabbath a sign of? That he is the Lord our God and the Lord that sanctifies his people. Well then, when that sign by which he is known to the people is taken out of the way they take him away from the knowledge of the people that is what they are after and that thing is now done i read before god's memorial has been torn down and in its place a false sabbath stands before the world all the power of the earth is now enlisted in that business so they propose to blot out the knowledge of god from the world therefore we need to seek the lord with all the heart that the heathen shall not rule over us. Now let us see what he is going to do. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. What is it that he will send? What is the oil? The oil of joy for mourning, joy in the Holy Ghost. What is the wine? Jotham tells us that wine maketh glad the heart of God and man. Gladness, then, he will give. And what is the corn, the wheat, the grain, which comes from, our, from which comes our bread to sustain, sustain life and supply strength? Strength, then, also will he give. Oh, then, thank the Lord. He will send us strength and gladness and joy. But to whom will he send it? When will he send it? When the people are gathered... And the congregation assembled, and the children and the babies, the elders, the bridegrooms, the brides, and the ministers, when they are gathered together, as the testimony says, in companies, seeking God with all the heart, then it is that he will do what he says. Let us go at it as never before. It is a wonderful thing when the Lord promises that we shall be satisfied with what he is going to give. It is not according to our measure. How much is God satisfied that we should be satisfied with? Nothing short of everything he has. For he gave just that in Jesus Christ. And he does not want us to stop short of everything he has. Just as Brother Haskell read in that blessed testimony this morning. You remember what wonderful thing that was. That when we come as beggars, having no uh, desserts of our own, that all is ours in one everlasting gift. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you uh, the northern army, and I will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the East Sea and his hinder part toward the uttermost, utmost sea. 
and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. The margin of this verse says, he hath magnified to do great things. Who is it that has magnified to do great things? Who has all the power of the world in his hands? Satan. It is he who thinks he is going to do great things. Now let us see what the Lord will do just then. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. My brethren, we ought to be the gladdest people in the world that Satan has to do great things. For it follows inevitably that when Satan has got to do great things, God is doing such great things that Satan has to exert himself to save his credit. But even then, um, he cannot save his credit, even though he has boasted before the world and the nations that he has all the power. His case gets so desperate at last that he has got to come to himself. But we can be gladder than ever because then Jesus comes himself. But when is it that the Lord will do great things? When this one Satan has magnified himself to do great things. So, you know, one of the things that we see in this, in this study here that we've talked about many times is the idea that the Sunday law isn't just going to come about, that there is two things happening at the same time. There's God preparing a people, and there is also um, God then allowing this trial to come upon his people. Because Satan couldn't do any of this if God didn't allow it to occur, correct? Correct. Yes. You, you can't have this Sunday law just come out of nowhere. And God has to allow it to happen. And he allows it to happen when it's the time to happen. And it's the time to happen when we are in that reform line in those way marks and God's people are experiencing those messages. And so we can't expect that the Sunday law is imminent when we don't have a people that's ready to go through that Sunday law. And so we need to follow this counsel. We need to blow the trumpet. We need to call a solemn assembly. We need to gather together. God's people have to be united. Now, this movement is, is not all there is of God's people. Would we agree with that? Yes. So, so we know that this movement is, is given as part of a reform line, of preparing a message to call God's people. But we can't call God's people if we are first not called. This has to happen first for us. What we expect to happen to those that we call first has to happen to us. And if we can't come to the upper room, if we can't be converted, if we can't recognize our sins and the damage that we have done, we can't call anyone else. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. Why should we be discouraged? What is the use of it? Uh, what is the sense of it? Jesus said, lift up your heads, and this say, be glad and rejoice. And then says it over again, be glad, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. Let us do it, brethren. I just tell you, I don't know how to do anything else than be glad, for the Lord tells me to. And this is just as much the word of God as any other part of the word of God. And the creative power is in these words just as, as much as in any other, to put the gladness there and put the rejoicing there. And it is gladness. It is rejoicing in the Lord. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Or as the verse, at, or, as at, or as at the first, as some versions read. 
Now, remember when we were looking at uh, Brother Caldwell and Brother um, Stanford, Statford, I can't remember their names, um, that Ellen White referred to, and, and they were quoting from this verse as well, right? They were applying it to the World's Fair in Chicago, having to do with how they supposed what had happened um, at the World's Fair and how it was tied to the first month. Correct. Okay. But we can see that Ellen White says that this work is going on, right? That there was a work that was being done at the General Conference, but that Brother Caldwell and Stanton were not affected by that work. That is, they needed to confession and repentance. And we have to be careful because we could be just that such a person that we don't recognize our need of confession and repentance. So we know that the former rain comes in the fall and the latter rain in the spring, correct? Right. Right. In the first month. Right, okay. because it's going to ripen the grain. You know, it's going to be, be part of that part of the harvest. So, I mean, it comes what near the, the end. Month? What's that? What is the first month? First month is in the spring. That's where you have Passover and the wave sheaf offering and, and all those things, first fruits. And, and then Pentecost follows uh, seven weeks later after first fruits. So, so we know that we have this uh, former rain and latter rain. Um, so these are types of the Holy Spirit. First, the former rain uh, after you've planted your crops to allow them to grow and the latter rain um, for the harvest. So it doesn't say here the former rain and the latter rain both come in the first month. It's the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. That's the way that I understand it. Was that at Pentecost a moderate thing according to what God is going to do? Was, yes, he gave the former rain moderately. So here, A.T. Jones is applying as we do the former rain to what happened in at Pentecost. But it was also the latter rain too, wasn't, wasn't it? You mean the latter rain moderately, you said? Well, well, the former rain moderately, it says. But from the perspective of the lines, when we look at what happened on the day of Pentecost, it was typifying the latter rain. Right? It, it was fulfillment of the prophet jo Joel, right? It wasn't just about the former rain itself. Correct? Yes, continue. Okay. So so we know that we apply it though as the as the as the former rain because the latter rain comes at the end of the world. Correct? Yes. So we can have many applications of this former rain and latter rain. Is it true that the former rain also comes in Millerite history? Don't we make an application of the former rain in Millerite history and the latter rain in our history? God looks to send it, yes. Yeah. But do we also have the former rain in our history as well as the latter rain in our history? Ellen White makes that application. Yeah, okay. So, so we know that this is not a one-time thing, that it's a part of a reform line. That you have to have a former reign and you have to have a latter reign in each reform line. And depending on which reform line you're on, 
is how you will decide where the former rain and the latter rain is. So there's still lots that we need to understand about this. But I, I'm pointing out that, that we have a false understanding of what this meant, which was Brother Caldwell and Brother Stanton. And we have A.T. Jones presenting in 1893 and Ellen White endorsing this message. Even though A.T. Jones was presenting that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 had already come down. But there was a work that was beginning here that was a true work, but it just did not complete. Okay, so uh, we'll go on. Was that at Pentecost? A moderate thing according to what God is going to do. Yes, he gave the former rain moderately. So Jones is saying that's the former rain. But there's going to be a double portion at this time. If that was moderate, what do you suppose this is going to be? We can't imagine what that was. Let us read you a word in volume four, page 611. So this would be... Uh, the Great Controversy, just volume four of The Great Controversy, I believe. I don't think he's referring to the testimonies. Anyway, the Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. And the first angel's message was carried to every missionary state, station in the world. And in some countries, there was the grandest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century, but these are to be far exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. So we look at 1840 to 1844, that's the 1,533 days, August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. And this was um, the grandest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But this is gonna be far exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. So we have something ahead of us that is going to be greater than what happened in those 1,533 days and greater than what had happened in the Reformation of the 16th century. So if we look at that, this is something far beyond what God has already done in this movement, is it not? Agreed. That what he has done in this movement is going to catch fire and is going to go around the world in a power that we have never seen. And that's not going to be because we somehow have some really nice charts or we got some really good videos because there's lots of people with really nice charts, much nicer charts than ours and much better quality videos than ours. Um, I was having a, a discussion on academia with uh, somebody I don't really know who he is, but you know, he, he doesn't believe well, he believes the real issue here is the Godhead, right? You know, it's the Sabbath, the, the state of the dead, and the Godhead issue, the Trinity. These are the errors, you know, Sunday observance, uh, the immortality of the soul, and uh, the Trinity, right? And these are pretty slick videos. Um, right here, I'm, I'm just going to put it up on the screen just to show you the quality. You might not see it if you're... Uh, looking through this year, but the quality of these videos. Yeah, is uh, that the judgment or? Um, the let me see. Judgment hour. Yeah, and it's yeah, this yeah, one. Ex yeah, extremely high quality. Yeah, yeah, extremely high quality. So I'll just uh, put them up here. So if you look at these videos, I mean. Uh, just 
you can see this. This this is how their video starts off. A lot better than anything this movement has done as far as quality. And um, but yet, you know, and this is here about the mark of the beast. The first two thirds are pretty much standard uh, conservative Adventist understanding of um, you know the Sunday Sabbath issue, and then about two thirds in, it's going to start going to the Council of Nicosia. Um, and misrepresenting what was at that council, what was presented at that council, because that council wasn't about the Trinity. Um, it was uh, about, um, you know, they still taught that Jesus was begotten, right? And, and he's trying to say that they're, anyway, I'm not going to go into all the things. But the point is, we have these videos that are definitely much better than anything we're probably ever going to put out, right? So it's not gonna be because we have better videos or better charts or better organization. Why, why is this mighty movement, why is it going to far exceed any other movement that has ever occurred? As God is God well, it's going to be because God's people are converted. Is that not the reason? That his glory is going to be seen upon us? Well, I was going to say the perfect character of Christ. Yeah, it's the character of Christ seen upon his people. You know, we talked about, you know, being lifted up as an enzyme. But were we ready to be lifted up as an enzyme? I mean, we know that we weren't. No. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, we couldn't even get along amongst ourselves. God's not going to lift up those type of people as an enzyme. One is it wouldn't be very powerful. Nobody would be attracted to it or drawn to it. It wasn't, we, we were, we weren't any different than the church. We made a profession of things, but we're unwilling to live those things. There would be those that would talk the talk, but they would not walk the walk. Mm -hmm. They would not place the character of christ into daily practice and daily living and that's all of us yes okay another testimony that has never been printed says that this will come as suddenly as it did in 44 with 10 times the power but now about the pentecost we read from the same that's page 611 of volume 4 as follows the prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Now you see there are prophecies pertaining only to the latter rain, but the prophecies pertaining to the former rain are to be fulfilled too in the giving of the latter rain. And you see it is going to be double. Right? So what Jones is saying here, there's prophecies pertaining only to the latter rain, but the, the prophecies of the former rain are also to be fulfilled. That is, he is taking here that there is a repeat of history. What happened under the former rain is illustrating what happens under the latter rain. <coughs> Excuse me. Correct. And Jones has done this a few times. That's he, what it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. He's he's created these parallel histories. He understands this, that this is a reform line. He doesn't necessarily understand it in all the detail we do, but he understands the principle here. The principle is we have uh, what happened under the former reign is repeated in the giving of the latter reign. <clears throat> have you sent this thing out? The this paper? Yeah, this, uh, I think it's 1890-something. Yeah, yeah. well, I sent out this. This is um, 
all of Joan's general conference uh, bulletin messages. Your bird's whistling too loud. I have to turn off your mic. Um, so this is all of, yeah, I sent this out. So this is a big file. I mean, it's 960 pages. So. Um, Thank you. I just, uh, I didn't know if you'd sent this out or not. Okay. Um, now you see there are prophet prophecies pertaining only to the latter rain, right? So we read that. It's going to be double because we can take these things and lay them over top of each other. Here are the times of refreshing of which the apostle Peter looked forward. So this is Ellen White speaking. When he said, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And she adds in the investigative judgment. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Now, I'm not sure if she adds that or if Jones adds it. Um, you'd have to look up the statement. Um, so Joan says, uh, does that mean that we shall repent and be converted? Well, says one, I was converted 20 years ago. All right, be converted now too. I was converted nearly 19 years ago, but it does not amount to that. The snap of the fingers. If I'm not converted right now, and it is no good to look way back there, says one, do you mean to say that I was not converted? Oh, no, I do not mean anything of the kind. But I mean that if you depend upon that conversion way back there, it does not amount to anything. If you do not know how to repent anymore, just take Jesus Christ and you will know. Any man who received the Lord Jesus Christ is a new creature. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Then praise the Lord. They will reproach us. They will call us names. They will make us as the filth and the offscoring of the earth and the despised of the despised. But God has said, my people shall never be ashamed. And it means just that. But it does not stop there. He says it over. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Why, I tell you, brethren, what is it that the Lord has not put into the chapter for us? See the encouragement, the blessedness, the promises, when it is and when it is necessary for him to repeat that we shall never be ashamed. That means on the face of it, that it will be the purpose of everything on earth to put us to shame. But God has pledged his word that it shall not be done, and we shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Thank the Lord. He is not going to be content much longer with one prophet. He will have more. He has done a wonderful work with one. And having done such a great work with one, what in the world will he do when he gets a lot of them? And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Where is going to be deliverance? In the remnant whom the Lord shall call. But who is Satan making war against? The remnant. Who has Satan rallied all the powers of the earth against? The remnant. Where is he directing all his force and efforts against the remnant? And right there is deliverance. Brethren, the best place in the world to be is right where the devil is spending all his efforts because there is deliverance. That is where the grace and power of Jesus Christ are. And Satan has got to rally all his hosts to make any show at all. 
That is the best place on earth to be because Christ is there. God is there. And my people shall never be ashamed. Brethren, I am awfully glad of these things. I am just as glad as I can be of what the Lord says in that chapter. Because it is all present truth, you see. Every verse is right now. So Jones is saying that it's present truth then. Is that the case now for us? Isn't everything we're seeing in what Jones is saying present truth for us right now? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's quite amazing how present truth it is. How Jones could be just here right now talking about our situa situation right now using these verses. In a sense, he is. <clears throat> Every verse is right now and tells such wondrous things. He is going to do such wondrous things. And all he asks of us is to seek him with all the heart that we may have it all. If we seek him with half the heart, we cannot have it all. We want to seek him with all the heart to get all he has. Let us do what the Lord says and be glad and rejoice, ye children of Zion, for the Lord will do great things and ye shall never be ashamed. And there is deliverance in the remnant that the devil is warring against with all his might. So we can see here, I mean, I mean I'm quite amazed at this, this study of Jones, what he's done so far in these first seven presentations. Uh, I mean, we can see the parallel. We can see that it is the message for this time. It's basically the message that God had given us already. But here, seeing it, when you see Jones presenting our message, what does that mean to us? What is that telling us? Jones was trying to share at that time, the message, the exact message that needed to be given to the world, yet many would not hear it because it conflicted with their own personal ideas of what should be done. Yeah, and we're in that same situation today, are we not? Yes, we are. And so if we're going to yield to God, we have to set aside our ideas. Um, you know, one of the things that's come up over the last year, so, so we know we're, we're taking this, this since December 25th, 2021, that we have had in this movement now, um, a marked separation that is with the introduction of Collins, uh, prediction regarding Trump. So back basically, um, less than 10 months ago. Um, you know, Colin made this, these presentations, uh, dividing the gold, uh, looking at uh, Daniel chapter 2, uh, Daniel chapter 11, the first few verses, and Revelation 17, and bringing these together and, and creating a chronology that we find as part of our lives. And Odilio did, did a presentation then on the mandates, on uh, February 12th. I know it's the 12th. I think it's February 12th. And um, in his presentation, again, something correct. But the problem there is not what's correct. The problem is our ideas. So can we have things that are correct? but also be wrong. Apparently. Yes. We know. We've all done it. Uh, the Millerites, were they correct in their understanding of the prophecies? Not completely. Not completely. But they were correct as far as the time. But they didn't understand the prophecies completely. 
And it was hard for them to set aside their ideas, even after their prophecy failed, correct? Yes. Yes. Many people rejected October 22nd, 1844, after the time passed. But we even had people that accepted October 22nd, 1844, who were still time setting, right? And they set a date in November of 1851, you know, seven years. Bates, for a while, was supportive of this idea until the direct counsel from the Spirit of Prophecy corrected him. Correct. Are we going to be corrected in our ideas? Are we going to allow the Lord to correct us or not? And if we persist, persist holding on to our ideas, is that not the same as, as holding on to the world? Yes. It's no different whether we're holding on to the things of this world or just to our ideas. Even though we stand proclaiming the message of the Sunday law, that it's coming, we can still be holding on to our own ideas, just like the, the Judgment Hour video that I briefly showed you there. Here we have Adventists of sorts, not sure who they are exactly, uh, presenting the, the issues that we would understand regarding the Sunday law, but mixing in that this issue about the Godhead, that somehow we have to understand uh, that the Holy Spirit is not a person, it's just the Spirit of Christ, and that Christ uh, is not eternal. In, in I'm hearing that a lot in Adventist circles, too. Yeah. Facebook and such. Yeah, well, we see it. It's 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 become a hot issue over the last uh, number of years, probably the last 10, 12 years or so, that it's really come into Adventism. But the thing is, we have to set aside our ideas. We have to know how to submit to the teachings of Scripture and to to have to be humbled, to not be proud. Because when we're proud, we, we value our ideas more than we ought to. And the question is, are we teachable? Can we be corrected? This is a difficult thing. And it's a very deceptive thing. We can often see when we're living in open sin that we're wrong. But when we're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, we can deceive ourselves. And we can think that we're, we're, we're for the Lord 100% because we're doing so much work and we're so uh, focused upon what we believe that it must be correct. And yet we're not teachable. We're not correctable. I know we're supposed to go to the brethren and take it before the church to, to help, you know, if we have an idea or something. Well, Miller's rules, of course, you know. Yeah, I mean, we, we, but we need to be corrected by God's word. We also do need one another. I mean, right. if it wasn't for other people, I, I, I don't know what I would do. I need to be corrected. And, and God has often brought people to correct me. So, yeah, it, it's a difficult thing that God is asking of us. But it's not an impossible thing if we approach it correctly. If we allow God to break us, to break these earthen vessels that really aren't worth anything. If we can take away the filthy garments from us and clothe us with a change of raiment. But we can't put on Christ's righteousness if we still are wearing our filthy garment. We can't keep holding on to our righteousness and expect that we have Christ's righteousness. We have to recognize that we're nothing. Well, I guess we'll finish there unless anybody has any final thoughts before we close with prayer.
you know, just to look at what we're going to see next Friday, the first sentence of his message, uh, his eighth presentation. The evidences have been given to us showing over and over that we stand in the very presence of the events that bring the end of the world. And that is true today, is it not? And so we need to live we need to live as if this is true because we may say it's true but we don't live as if it's true okay well let's close with a word of prayer dear father in heaven we again are grateful Grateful for the Sabbath, grateful for the fellowship. We wish that we could all be together in person, but you've given us this opportunity for people all over the world to spend time studying together, and we're grateful for that. We pray that you can be with each one, that your presence can be with them, that they can be comforted in their trials. I pray, Lord, that we can recognize our need of you, our need of repentance, and that we can pray for those with whom we have conflict, with whom we differ, and that you can use us uh, to reach to those in darkness, that you can reach the darkness in us and shine your light upon it, and that we can open the door of our hearts to allow Christ to come in to cleanse our hearts. Forgive us for our sins and help us to learn each day of you. Be with each person again, we pray, those watching the videos, and may, um, may your work be accomplished upon this earth. And we ask that we can be a part of that work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.